It's natural for people just getting into Eurorack to worry about how to handle power for their rack. It makes sense. No one really wants to muck about with electricity, especially with an investment of a few hundred or thousands of dollars on the line. So it's not surprising that there are a lot of questions about it. But it's one of those topics that doesn't get a lot of attention. We just assume everyone's going to figure it out. So I wanted to make this video, just covering the basics of how power works for Eurorack. And along the way, I'm going to make some of the same mistakes that people worry about. So if you want to see what happens when you plug a module in backwards or overload your power supply, just stick around. The first thing to say is just don't panic. I don't want to come across as cavalier on the topic. It is still electricity and you want to be careful, but it's pretty low voltage so you're not likely to hurt yourself. And most modules and power supplies you buy tend to have pretty robust power protection circuits. They can take a lot more abuse than you might imagine. I've been into Eurorack for about five years now, including DIYing my own stuff and plugging in modules after a couple of drinks, and I've made my fair share of mistakes, and I haven't suffered too badly. But your experience may differ, and it's always worth double or triple checking something before you throw the switch. So I want to start with some basics of how Eurorack power cables and connectors work and what's going on with them. Then I'm going to talk about all of the many, many ways manufacturers indicate which direction power cables should go. Then we're going to go through some of the big what-ifs that people worry about. We're going to talk about how much current that a power supply generates and what happens if you draw too much of it. And then I'm going to tease a little bit about making your own cables. So let's start by just looking at some of the different connectors you might see in your rack. This is a tip-top Yuzu's power supply with a flying bus board. That just means the connectors are flopping around on the table or inside a case. There's nothing wrong with this, and given the Yuzu's lower price, a lot of us start out here. That's where I started. You can see that the connector has a shroud around it, a plastic box with a cutout that will only allow the power cable to be plugged in in one direction. So if you really worry about blowing things up, this is a good place to start since it physically keeps you from plugging it in wrong. From there we go to just a regular non-flying bus board. This is from my Pittsburgh Modular Move 104 case. You can see that the connectors are just mounted on a PCB and then fixed into the case. And then there are bus boards like in this Depfer case here. Those aren't shrouded. It just has the bare 16 pin headers sticking up out of the PCB. I honestly don't know why anybody would do this anymore except to save money, and only a couple of dollars at that. But it's still fairly common to see a setup like this. But what are all these pins for? 16 is a lot. You might think it only takes 3 or 4 pins for power, so what are the rest doing? And why do some connectors only have 10 pins? Let's take a look. The first thing to note is that the two rows of pins are the same. The pins are just duplicated on both sides. Starting at the bottom, there's the minus 12 volt supply, three ground pins, and then the plus 12 volts. If you're using a 10 pin connector, that's all there is. With a 16 pin connector, those extra pins include the five volt power supply, and then pins for CV and gate. It seems odd to have pins for gate and CV on the power connector, but that was part of the original standard. These don't seem to get used much these days, but the idea was that instead of having patch cables to wire up pitch CV from sequencer to oscillator or something, you could just pass that information across some extra pins. There are a few manufacturers who still make things that use these, Depfer of course, since he's the one who defined the standard, but 4MS uses it a lot as well. It confused the heck out of me once early on when a mystery gate kept firing and I had no idea why. Why two sets of pins though? And why does the ground get six pins out of ten? Ribbon cables weren't really meant to carry the power. It uses really thin wire, it's 28 gauge. So doubling it up really allows the cable to carry more current, and along the way makes the power more stable. Finally, these two rows of pins are structurally more strong than just a single row that could be easily twisted to the left or right when a connector was attached. So I talked about shrouded and unshrouded headers before, and some modules do use a shrouded header as well, so there's only one way you can connect the power cable. But a lot of modules don't do that. They just leave 10 bare pins sticking up and make you responsible for getting it plugged in properly, and this leads to probably 90% of all the questions about power. In the Eurorack standard, the red wire on the power cable is the one that carries minus 12 volts, and most modules will indicate on the back of the PCB which way it should point. Historically, it's always red striped down, but there's a lot of variability, and we'll look at that in a minute. The whole minus 12 volts gets the red wire is a bit weird, because in other uses, it's the positive voltage that gets the red stripe. And there are a very small number of manufacturers who bucked the depth for trend, and instead make their modules so the red stripe actually is plus 12 volts. Schweimann modules are the only example I could find, but you can see this from their website, and they're showing that the red stripe is up to plus 12 volts. And if you were to plug this in normally, you might be having a bad day. 
This is very rare, and if you're at the point of having one of these modules, you probably already know about it, but it's worth mentioning. But let's assume that you don't have a super expensive module from a company that can't follow standards. On the back of the module, you're likely to see something that looks like one of these. Maybe there's a big white stripe along one side of the power header, or my favorite, they just write in the word red in white text. They might mark one side as being the minus 12 volt or indicate which is pin one, which is always the red stripe. They might mark the positive side for some reason. So it's worth getting a magnifier out just to double check if it's a plus or a minus. And there are some modules that you can plug in either way. And then finally, there are some modules with no markings at all. And in pretty much every case, this is gonna be a depth for module and his standard is always red stripe down. And in many cases, these get mixed and matched together. Here's a West Oakland skip min, which just has a line, the word red, and the plus 12 noted. Here's a factory built nonlinear circuit squid axon. He actually uses red headers for the red line, which is awesome. Here we've got one that specifies both the plus and minus sides. Here's one with just minus 12 volts showing off to the side. This is a rings clone by After Later, and you can plug it in any way you want. Here's a 2HP verb, and because the module is so small, they just use a single row of pins and you can plug it in on one side of the power cable. And then of course we've got Depfer with their unmarked header, red stripe down. So now we come to the scary part, the what ifs, the part where Eurorack newbies worry that they'll blow up their fancy new modules. I'm gonna start by talking first about what happens if you plug a module in with the connector offset from the plug. If you plug it in off to the side, it's no big deal because the pins are all the same. It's possible that some part of the module won't be getting the power it expects, but I've never seen this happen. Offsetting it up or down, on the other hand, is more of a problem. But it's also harder to do because the cable connectors have a thick plastic end that you'd really have to wedge down between two sets of pins. But if you did offset it up or down by one, then you have some potential for damage. Look at the diagram. In the second example, it's offset upwards. That means the minus 12 pins aren't connected to anything, but the plus 12 pins are connected to the ground, which would cause a short. This wouldn't affect the module. This is about the power supply, and most power supplies are able to handle this if you catch it quickly. The same goes for if it's offset downwards. Then it's the minus 12 that's shorted to ground. Same thing. If you have a cheap power supply, there's potential for damage, but most are gonna be able to handle it, and this is still relatively difficult to do. Now, if you were to do this with a 16-pin connector, there's a bigger chance for damage because you could potentially send plus 12 volts down the connector that expects plus 5 volts, and that could fry something inside the module. But again, this is pretty difficult to do in practice. But here's the big one. What happens if you plug it in upside down? If you have a 10-pin cable and reverse it, you're effectively reversing the plus 12 and minus 12 lines, and that could damage op amps or other ICs. And if you do it with a 16-pin connector, you could send plus 12 volts down the gate connection, and if they use that, it could burn something out. But let's take a look at what to expect with a pretty standard module. Here's mutable instrument rings. I should have shown it working first on screen, but trust me, it works fine. Then I unplug the power connector, flip it backwards, put it back on, and then flip the switch. Just kidding. Nothing happened at all. No fireworks, no magic smoke. The only way you can tell something is wrong is that rings just didn't light up as you'd expect. You can see that the power supply ran as normal. And if I turn it off, flip the power back around and start it up again, rings works fine. I want to repeat that you really should be careful about these things. But in five years, I've made a number of mistakes and I've only ever killed one module and that was a Turing machine that I had built myself. The best practice you can develop, I've found, is just to double check all the connections, and when you do go to turn something on, keep one hand near the switch, watch the module, and if it doesn't do what you think it should, or if you have any concerns, just turn it off immediately. The next question that people often have comes from Modular Grid. It's a great resource, but it seems to have made people a little anxious about how much power their system is going to need. So let's run a couple of tests. For the first test, I'm going to start with my Yuzu's. Down in the text, you can see that it gives a maximum current of 2,000 milliamps for the plus 12 rail and 500 milliamps for the minus 12. Now, 2,000 milliamps or 2 amps is actually quite a bit. So I'm going to go after the lower 500 milliamp rating on the minus 12 volt rail. Even still, I really had to hunt around to put together a single 84 HP row that would exceed that. 
Luckily, the WMD performance mixer came to the rescue with its gigantic 430 milliamp draw on the minus 12. When you add in the other modules, we're up to 483 milliamps on the minus 12 rail. I've got it set up as described, I flip the switch and... Well, at least it's more exciting than the reverse power header example. It starts up, fails, shuts off, tries again a second later, shuts off. I can disconnect the WMD and it works just fine, no harm done. We're under the 500 milliamp limit, so what's happening? Well, most of the time the stated power requirement is sort of for the sustained current that's needed, but often it needs more right up front for startup. So even though 483 is lower than 500, when it first starts up, it's spiking above that limit and it overloads the power supply. That's why the usual recommendation is you should stay around 70 to 80% of the listed maximum to allow for that startup spike. But let's try another test. I'm gonna do a two row setup here in the Depfer case with the PSU2 in it. It's rated for 1200 milliamps on both the plus 12 and minus 12 rails. So I assembled this little beast of a case, and again, thanks to the WMD mixer, we're able to push the plus 12 draw up to almost 1,350 milliamps. I flipped the switch, and it worked just fine. I tried adding a couple more modules, and it just kept working. So is it more powerful than actually listed, or more forgiving, or are some of the modules drawing less than it says? It's hard to say, but whatever it is, it makes for a crummy demo. So instead, that's the case I used for the background music for this video. As we've seen, Eurorack modules and power supplies are more forgiving than you may have thought, and Modular Grid, as great a resource as it is, isn't the final word on if the rack you design is going to work with any particular power supply. Electricity always deserves respect when you're working with it, but I do hope that if you were nervous about Eurorack power at the start of the video, you're feeling a little better about it now. A minor power mishap isn't a guarantee of a fried module. Just be alert, double check, and be ready to shut stuff down if it doesn't behave how you expect. Oh, and one more thing on the topic of power, those power cables. They're a bit of a limited resource. You only get one with each module, and you're stuck with whatever length they give you, which can be a problem if you've got a particularly deep case or something. And as soon as you start to build modules, then you're gonna need more, and buying them from a retailer can be pretty expensive. So can you make your own? You bet, and it's not even that hard. I have this whole extra box of cables that I was able to make, and I'm gonna go into how to do it specifically in another video, so keep an eye out for that. Thanks for watching, and if you made it this far, why not consider subscribing? It's what all the cool kids are doing.